Okay, well that makes just about 1 o'clock Pacific, 4 o'clock Eastern, so I think I'm going to go ahead and just uh, get us kicked off. Uh, I want to thank everyone again for joining today. Uh, I'm happy people are interested in learning a little bit more from uh, our speaker, Carrie, today. Um, this, uh, we're also joining our webinar by uh, Joanna Knox at Fundbox, and we'll be uh, giving you guys a little bit more information about you know, NOFI's partnership with them as well. Uh, Carrie is a professional business coach who is going to give you some more information on strategies to increase profitability. And uh, she's got a great presentation laid out for us, so I'm just going to go ahead and hand it off to her, and uh, she'll be taking it away. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, come through okay on my end. Excellent. So um, good to virtually meet you all. Thanks for everybody who's here live on the line. Um, I've got a bunch of stuff today. I'm going to go pretty fast, so I'll just ask that you listen fast. <laughs> Feel free to take notes. Um, but if you've never used Zoom before, you'll find a little chat box down at the bottom in your control panel, and that'll be the best way for, uh, for us to communicate since everybody's on mute just to prevent distractions. So do me a favor, if you want to send a message, because there will be a few times throughout that I'll ask you some questions or uh, look for participation. Um, the default is to send the message to everyone, but if you prefer, you can click the little blue drop down and select my name, and then I'll be the only person who sees uh, your message. So it'd be great if we could move forward like that. In fact, I'll start with the quick question right now. I'm, I'm curious, how many of you on the line today are business owners uh, versus employees of, of a company? And if you wouldn't mind right now, just find that little chat feature on the Zoom control panels. And again, you have the option to send the message to me or to everyone. So far, it's looking like all owners on the line, which is fantastic. And I, ha I have quite a bit of experience in um, the, the industries. You know, my partnership with Funbox and with Noify all line up really, really well. In addition to being a business coach of various types of industries over the past 13 years, I do have a niche specifically in various types of contracting services. Um, so. I'm looking forward to sharing this with you. This is right up, up my alley, the kinds of businesses that I work with. These exact same things I'm going to be sharing with you is what I work with my clients on every single day. So our purpose today, what we're here to accomplish is I want to teach you the formula for profit so that you can understand a simple but mathematical way that growing profit in your business doesn't have to be a mystery and it doesn't have to be elusive. There's actually specific steps that you can do. Um, and I'm going to share with you a ton of strategies to implement. Not all of them will be right for your business. Um, some of them maybe you're already doing, but my goal is if you could leave here with one, two, maybe three things tops that you can actually implement into your business that will help you grow the bottom line. Um, my business is called Action Coach, so I'm not a think about it coach, I'm not a webinar coach. Um, I don't just want to educate you today. I want to give you something that's actually, you know, actionable that you could take action on really the minute you leave this webinar. So a little bit of background um, for those of you who have no idea who I am is, uh, as I mentioned, I've been a business coach for 13 years. I have a background in, in business as well as an MBA, um, but I got started in this because I grew up in a family business. So I worked in my dad's business for several years and I eventually moved on into corporate America because I thought I was too big for the family business. Um, and in a kind of a roundabout way, I was working uh, with a coworker of mine and he walks to my office one day and he goes, I know somebody that does something that I think you'd be good at. And he introduced me to a business coach. Um, so now I own a franchise uh, that's worldwide. There's over a thousand action coach offices around the world. And the one I own is in San Diego. Um, and we are known for getting great results. In fact, we're the only coaching organization that guarantees it. Um, I guarantee to pay for myself within four months or I'll coach my clients for free until I do. So our results are proven. Um, my clients grow an average of 31% year over year. Um, and so that's that. I'm also licensed with gazelles or scaling them if you're familiar with that as well. Um, this is where I get to live. Um, beautiful San Diego. Is there, are there any San, Diego, San Diegans on the line? Just curious. So give me a shout out. Um, that's my husband, Scott. We've been married. We just celebrated our 15 year anniversary a couple of months ago and um, we're continuing the celebrations because next week we're leaving for a couple week trip to Australia. So that's my husband. His name is Scott. Um, my the rest of my family, my daughter, Kenzie, she's eight and my son, Cole, 
uh, just turned five, as you can tell by his little high five he's giving you there. Um, so these are the reasons why I do what I do and kind of how I got here. So now that you know a little bit more about me, um, can I have your permission to be your coach today? Is everybody willing to treat this like a coaching session and be willing to be challenged and to grow over the next 45 minutes or so? Is that cool? Awesome. So I have some rules then, since you're all now agreeing to let me be your coach, this is the first rule of a coaching session, is that you have to be learn, willing to learn new things, which means that the words I know are not allowed in coaching sessions. Um, Brian Tracy said, if information alone were enough, all the librarians would be rich, right? I don't just want to give you information. Because it's not just about what you know, it's what you do with what you know. Um, I don't know how long you've been in business, uh, most of you, but I'm guessing most of you has been, you know, quite some time. You know a lot of stuff. Maybe you've read some books, maybe you've learned through the school of life, um, or just through your, you know, many years of business experience. Um, but if you find yourself tempted during this webinar to say, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah, I've heard that before, instead replace it with this, with an, isn't that interesting mentality, right? Just keeps an open mind. Um, because again, it's, it might just take one little tweak. You might know something already, but maybe you're not doing it consistently. You might have tried something, but let's face it, maybe you sucked at it and you didn't try it very well. <laughs> so challenge yourself today. When you do, you'll get what I call blinding flashes of the obvious. BFOs for short. That's that aha moment when something you already knew connects with something else you already knew and you go, aha, you know, why haven't I been doing that? Or if you've been in business for a while, you might say, you know, I used to do that. And somehow over time, I've drifted away from it. So wherever you are in that, I hope that you leave here with a couple of BFOs, blinding flashes of the obvious to grow your business. So to give me some perspective and, and help me help you most today, if you'd be willing to share, again, you can share this privately, um, but what's your number one business growth challenge? If you want to change that um, everyone button in the chat box, you can send it directly to me. I'm Carrie Kaufman. Um, if you don't want to share this publicly, I'd be the only person to see that. But I'm going to take a sip of my water here. We'll give you guys a second to answer this question. Okay. If you're still typing, feel free to keep typing them in, letting some responses roll in now. Okay, so kind of all over the board. A few mentioning labor, quality employees, marketing, operations, cash flow, team, lead generation. Okay, so. So good mix. The good news is we're going to be touching on uh, all these things today in one way or another. Uh, but as I said, we'll, we'll be moving pretty fast. So if there's something specific that you want me to go deeper on, um, feel free to interrupt me via chat. And if I have an opportunity, I'll address your question as it comes up. If I'm not able to get to it right away, then I'll save it for the end. So my intention is to allow a little bit of time for Q&A towards the end um, so that I can help everybody get exactly what you came for out of the webinar. Here's what I know about you. After over a decade of working with your industry, um, what I know about people who would register and attend this type of educational webinar, right, is that you're good at what you do. Right? You wouldn't have made it this far in business. Um, it's, you know, there's a, a lot of varying reputations and service levels in your industry. So for you to be where you are actively investing and in taking time out to work on your business, that tells me that you're one of the good ones, right? That you actually really care about your business and the way you provide the service. Um, but what I know uh, from uh, also from working with clients in your industry is that for the most part, nobody ever actually taught them how to run a business. You know, they're good at what they do because they're good at what they do. You know, perhaps, uh, you know, they used to work for a contractor and then one day they open up their own contracting business. So they've learned the ropes just through pure grit, through hands-on experience. But nobody ever taught them how to run a business specifically. And that's even true of my clients who some of them have multiple degrees. You know, they could even have business degrees, but that doesn't mean anybody actually taught them how to run a business. 
So what a lot of my clients struggle with is that they're good at what they do. So they're excellent at being a service provider, but I want to make you an expert business owner, right? Not just provide, provide an excellent service, but being an expert at actually running the business. But the challenge with running a business like a business is that being the best in your industry alone isn't going to help you grow. Now it will to some extent, you know, being good at what you do will take you quite a ways. It will keep you in business, but you'll eventually tap out. You'll kind of hit the ceiling where your growth starts to peter out. You know, like I said, you're good enough to stick around. You can withstand the um, economic challenges and marketing challenges and this and that, but less than 1%, in fact, 0.4% of businesses in the United States ever go on to exceed 10 million in revenue. Of the millions, I think there's 28 million, give or take, registered companies in the United States and 0.4% exceed that 10 million. So what does it take to get them there? You know, why is it that just being good at what you do isn't enough to help the business really, really scale beyond that level? Well, one of the challenges is that you're already busy. There's already too much going on. You're also working with trying to get the staffing levels worked out and trying to manage the cash flow and trying to uh, handle the marketing and you know navigating the job costing and all these different things. So in the end, not enough businesses hit their full potential because it's not because the, the leaders aren't smart enough or talented enough or that they don't provide good enough service but they kind of stay stuck in this rhythm, right? They say, you know, from the inside, it looks like a ladder. So you feel really busy. You're going, going, going all the time, but God forbid that hamster ever quits running the whole wheel or your whole business comes to a stop. The opportunity though, is when you, when you learn the formula for profit, when you really understand how to build a profitable business, you can stop that cash flow roller coaster. Um, perhaps you've had this experience where you market, for business, and then um, the good news and the bad news is it works, right? And you get the business, and then you're busy serving. So it goes this, this roller coaster goes market, 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 serve, serve, serve. Because then you get too busy, wrapped up in the jobs, the marketing efforts stop, and then the jobs start to come to close, and you're like, crap, now we've got no leads. Market, 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 serve, serve, serve. Or perhaps your version of that roller coaster is you can't afford to hire help when you're slow. But then when you get busy and you need the help, you don't have the time to hire and train. That could be your version of the roller coaster. But the opportunity when you run it like a business instead of like a job is that you can achieve bottom line results that are higher than industry standards, right? So I wanna help you carve out that roadmap today and build your business based on systems, not based on sweat. Um, does anybody know what job stands for, J-O-B? Have you heard that before? Just over broke is what that stands for. <laughs> so building your, have you built yourself a business or have you built yourself something that keeps you busy, you know, trading time for money um, and, you know, versus a business that can actually run without you. Now, uh, about a year and a half ago, I sent out a little picture to my database that had these exact same boots in it. And the caption said, um, sweat builds you a job systems build you a business and when my clients got it and he came to our next coaching session and he said coach those boots in the picture said those look like my boots I don't want to be wearing these boots anymore he said I really want to systemize my business so that I can get myself out of the field and out of the day-to-day -day. so he set a goal for himself that he wanted to retire his work boots he wanted to be a business owner versus a technician in his own business the way we define that an action coach, uh, a, a true business, and it's a commercial profitable enterprise that can work without you. Now that doesn't mean that nobody runs it. It doesn't mean that you don't run it. It just means the business works, not just the business owner works. So whether it's you or it's management, or maybe someday you choose to sell it, or you choose to have passive income from it, whatever your personal goals are, that the business makes that possible, right? Cause that's, that's the difference in building yourself a business and building yourself a job. Um, I'm pleased to say that my client did that. He retired his boots December 31st of last year. Those are his actual boots. I sent him that box so they're now framed like a trophy in their office. <laughs> um, but that was the representation to him of building a profitable enterprise that doesn't require him to be hands-on in the field day-to-day -day in order to make it happen. 
So who's driving your business? You know, where are you in this, in this relationship? Are you in the driver's seat? Are you in the passenger seat? Are you, you know, bound and gagged in the trunk just along for the ride, right? So are you in charge? Are your clients in charge? Are your competitors in charge? Is the economy in charge? You know, what is it that's really driving you? And you probably heard the statistics that over 80% of small businesses fail. And I believe there's probably a lot of reasons why that's true, by the way. You know, they could be, you know, lack of funding, cash flow, don't know how to market, you know, can't get the work done. Uh, lots and lots of reasons why that is. But I believe ultimately the number one reason for business failure is that business owners just run out of gas. You just get burnout because you're wearing all the hats, right? Richard Branson says, if you can learn to run one business successfully, there's no reason you can't run any number of businesses at the same time. The principles are the same. So as I mentioned, I coach a lot of different industries, but I do have a pretty strong niche in contracting services, anything from um, remodel to HVAC and granite and tile and electrical and plumbing and you know all of the above. But regardless of what the business or the industry is, the principles don't change. We adapt them to fit each unique business or each unique industry, but the formula for profit I'm about to share with you applies to every business in the world, regardless of your industry and regardless of your size. So this has a multiplying effect. We call it the five ways because there's five variables in this formula that you can impact in the formula for profit. So here's what it is. The formula for profit states that how many leads you get times how many leads you convert equals your customers, right? Because you know just because what it takes to get a lead and what it takes to convert that lead into a paying customer, two different things, right? Would you agree? So those are two different strategies. Customers is a result. So if you were to come to me and say, Carrie, I need some coaching, I wanna get more customers. And some of you said that earlier when I asked your biggest challenge, you said getting customers. Like, well, does that mean you need to get more leads or you need to convert more of the leads you already have because those are different strategies and perhaps you need both. Now, customers alone do not determine your revenue. Those two next variables in blue is what determines your revenue. Number of transactions per customer. Um, in other words, think about it like this. Um, do you have customers who could be doing more business with you than they are? They could have you back for repeat projects, um, on a more consistent basis, right? Perhaps you might even have customers who don't even know everything you could do for them. They might know you for one type of service you provide, but not realize that you also offer other services that they could benefit from. So number of transactions per customer over a defined period of time, let's say a year, and the average dollar sale, that's how much they spend at every transaction. Those things determine your revenue. Well, then you've got your profit margins, and for this conversation, we'll say it's all the expenses it takes to run your business, the cost of goods, you know, the labor, the materials, the overhead, all of those things combined, and what you're left with is your profit. So in other words, there are three results that all of us are after, customers, revenue, profit. There are five variables that determine those three results, the five things in blue. At the end of the day, there's only five things you can work on in order to grow your profit, and that's it right there. That's all you need to know to grow your business. Now, underneath each one of those blue variables are strategies, and I'm gonna share some of those with you. Specific strategies for increasing leads, conversion rate, number of transactions, etc. cetera. Um, but just out of curiosity, which one of those five variables, the, the blue ones, do you think holds the most potential for your business? In other words, let, let's talk untapped potential, low hanging fruit. You could get the quickest result if you picked which one of those five. Give you a second to answer. Wow, it's unanimously margin so far. I'll share a great story with you on that one in a little bit. Okay, anybody else? One of those five things in blue. We'll, we'll talk about all of them. Um, uh, when you say customers, which part of customers? Because customers is a result. Is it the number of leads or converting 
a prospect into a paying client or both. All right, so we've got answers all over the board. I think, I think each one of the five ways has been mentioned by at least one, one person, if not multiples. Okay. All right, excellent. So we'll, we'll start at the top. Um, I guess to give you some perspective on this, um, in a coaching environment, like if I was you know, working with a client one-to-one, -one, I would say that profit margins are usually the fastest to get results on. Um, because any improvements you make there go directly to the bottom line. Improving margins is, is typically more a, of an issue of systems um, and, and understanding your finances, which is a much easier fix. Whereas uh, marketing on the other hand, to generate new leads could take quite a bit of time. Um, so, but in, and that's where partnerships with, with companies like with Funbox could really give you some benefit and some leverage to make investments into your marketing, knowing it might take, you know, a couple of weeks or a couple of months for those to, to pay off and to produce pain results. So, all right, so let's move on. Lead generation, starting at the top. Now, there are over 80 something lead generation strategies in the Action Coach system. In fact, later I'm gonna show you a strategy picker um, I have a list of, of, you know, it's got a couple hundred different strategies on it uh, for each of the five ways. And uh, towards the end, I'll show you how you can get a copy of it. Um, but I've just picked the, the top few that work for most of my contracting clients, right? So perhaps you're doing some or all of these already. Referrals, right? Uh, web, that's pretty all-encompassing. That, that could really be sliced and diced into many strategies when you think about your social media or your website or your pay-per-click or your online uh, reviews and testimonials, uh, digital advertising, you know, there's a bunch that could go into that. Strategic alliances, what I mean by that is um, a lot of you probably get business from each other, right? Like I know, for example, the, the general contractor I coach, he also refers business to my landscaping contractor and to my tile contractor and to my HVAC contractor, you know, so that's what I would call street strategic alliance, meaning that you serve the same target audience, but in a complementary way, not a competitive way. Networking, advertising. Um, so, you know, who could stand to generate some more leads? A few of you here on the line indicated that that was your number one. Others of you, maybe it would be priority number two or three. Um, I, I have experienced that more businesses die of indigestion than they do of starvation. <laughs> so oftentimes getting the business is not the biggest challenge. It's, you know, profitably serving and executing on the business. But when it comes to marketing, I think that business owners misunderstand and frankly expect too much of an inanimate object. What we expect from marketing is to sell our stuff, but that's not marketing's job. All marketing's job description is, is, is to get the prospect to take the next step in the buying process. And I put a picture of a stadium up on there because uh, um, I read a great book years ago by a man named Chet Holmes. If you're looking uh, to improve on sales, I highly recommend a book called The Ultimate Sales Machine by Chet Holmes. And in that book, he talks about the concept of a stadium pitch. And I'll totally screw up the statistics, so don't hang your hat on the numbers I'm about to share. I'll just rather be honest about that. So just generalize with me. So he said, let's say, for example, you get to fill up in, in San Diego, we've got Petco Park. It's our biggest stadium. Uh, you get to fill it up with your target audience. Every seat is filled with somebody who you would define as an ideal customer. They have an opportunity to buy what you sell. And they're not there to see you, but yet you have your 60 seconds to give your pitch, you know, before we know whatever they're there to see. So this is representative of your marketing reaching your target audience. So in other words, when somebody's um, scrolling through their social media, they weren't looking for you, but perhaps they'll get exposed to you along the way, right? They're exposed to your marketing. At any given point in time, when your marketing reaches its target audience, less than 10% of the, of the um, people who see it are actively in the market for what you sell. Less than 10%. And this is where I'm fudging the statistics. I think it's actually less than 5%, but let's just generalize. Even if it was as high as 10%, that's pretty small. People who are actively in the market for what you sell, like they're looking to buy it right now. Now there's another 10% on the opposite end of that scale who will never be your clients. 
even though on paper they would meet your definition, they meet all the demographics of somebody who could be, but they won't. But that leaves a majority, let's say 80 plus percent, 80 to 90 percent of people fall in between those two spectrums. Now of that group, let's cut them in half. There's about 40% of this of the of the whole target audience who is not looking for what you do, but if they saw an opportunity, if something came up, they could be persuaded to make a decision, even though it was not in their plans, it was not in their budget. They could be influenced, in other words. And the remaining 40% are people who could be your customers, but the timing's not right. They might be ready in a week, a month, a year, or five years, right? The problem is most marketing is only designed to attract the first five to 10%. And it does nothing to attract or engage people who are curious, people who are thinking about it, people who might be ready in the future. So I think we waste a lot of opportunities because we're hoping that marketing is going to generate a sale when really all it needs to do is to get them to raise their hand, somehow get them to engage with you. That gives you the opportunity then to stay in touch, to build a relationship, to influence them, whether they're ready now or in the future. It's a long-term strategy, right? So when you're thinking about your marketing, I want you to put on your prospect hat, think like a client, think like a buyer, become a customer of your own business. So ask yourself this question. If you're looking to differentiate yourself, uh, let's say that you're looking to escape price competition. You're looking to help your, the consumers in your community understand why your business is different from the competitor down the road. Ask yourself, what are the primary fears, concerns, and frustrations that my target audience has in doing business with my industry? Not with you specifically, just with your industry. What are their fears? What are their concerns? What are their frustrations? On the other hand, you could ask yourself, what do they want? What are their aspirations? In their words, right? This is the key to identifying their hot buttons and crafting your marketing message to speak their language. So in other words, don't sell a drill, sell a hole, right? Sell the benefits of what you do, not just the features of what you do. Because in order to create a unique selling proposition, right? This is, this is how you know you have a niche. You have a niche when you've ident uh, effectively identified your points of uniqueness, but it has to be truly unique. Now I gotta say, your industries are notorious for uh, violating this first rule, that a unique selling proposition has to be unique. Here's why. I ask businesses all the time, what is it that makes you unique? What sets you apart from your competition? Any guesses what the primary answer I get is, like 90 plus percent of the time? What would business owners say makes them unique and sets them apart from their competition? Any ideas? Yep, Yvonne got it. Best service. We provide the best service. We're the best at what we do, right? Now, if most businesses say that, how unique is it really? And it might actually be true. Perhaps your quality of work, your quality of service is actually better than your competitors. But if everybody says it to, to consumers, it's white noise. Consumers have a baseline expectation that you're gonna show up and you're gonna do a decent job, right? That's a basic expectation. So it doesn't make you unique, right? It just meets an expectation. It doesn't exceed an expectation. Now, that doesn't mean that service won't set you apart. It just means when you're marketing to a cold audience who doesn't already know you and there's not a reputation and a connection built, that they will not necessarily prioritize that and be willing to pay a premium price for it. So it has to be relevant, right? And it's got to be worthy of making a buying decision. Worthy of making a buying decision. And last but not least, it's got to be effectively communicated. Now, how you'll know you've effectively communicated your unique selling proposition is that it helps you to escape price competition. So that when a consumer says, well, I got two quotes, or I got three quotes, and this one's a little bit higher than the other one, but I just feel better about doing business with them. Right? It just feels right. I trust them more. Whatever words they might assign to it, I don't know if you've ever seen uh, the, the TED Talk, Start With Why by Simon Sinek, but he talks about how the part of our brain that controls 
um, decision making is not the same part of our brain that, that controls our language, which is why we oftentimes say we, we make gut feeling, instinct feelings, or um, we make decisions based on how, you know, what your gut says about it, which isn't actually true. It's just how we, you know, it, I feel better. I feel more confident uh, going with this provider over another, right? So, um, if you have customers now who tell you that they're they're purely price shopping, there might be some percentage of them that, that truly, truly are, and perhaps those aren't meant to be your customers. But a majority of buyers buy based on value, not based on price alone. And I've had this experience, I'm actually going through a remodel right now. I have uh, five of my own clients who are working in my home over the span of a few months, because I'm using all my, you know, because I know they're great and I trust them to work on my home. Um, but you know, I've had this experience myself that the HVAC company that I coach now, we met originally, I think I've been working with her for five years now, um, because she did the HVAC in my home. We bought a new home. We needed a new system installed and I didn't know her yet. So we got a couple of quotes and theirs came in a little bit higher, but my husband was the one who met with the technicians and he said, I just like their technician better. I felt like I trusted him. He took, he was slower. He explained things. He gave me a few options. It was more of a consultative type of a sales approach versus somebody who just came in and said, this is what you need. And it, for him, that elicited a higher level of trust where he was willing to pay a little bit more because he felt great about his experience with the, the first or the second impression. Um, so moving on, let's talk about conversion. The second of the five ways. This is about getting curious people who have called and perhaps requested a consultation or they've requested a proposal and getting them to actually become paying customers. A handful of ideas on how to improve your conversion rate. One is what we've just been talking about, which is to clearly articulate your unique selling proposition. Testimonials also go a long way with that, as do follow-up processes. Did you know it takes an average of seven touches to make a sale? And that's industry agnostic. That's you know, not, not just your industry specific, but just sales in general. So having good follow-up processes or sales scripts in place um, it can really go a long way. Now, I coach a well-known uh, well builder in San Diego and their conversion rate, they're on the high price side, by the way, they, they only do large scale remodels. Um, so their conversion rate was very, very low. So I started digging in. They're, they're getting a lot of leads because they're, they're uh, third and fourth generation, currently be running by, being run by the third and fourth generations in town. Uh, so they get a lot of leads because they're well-known and well-established, but very you know small percentage of them were actually turning into the big jobs. So I said, well, what's your sales process like? You know, what's the process like from the time somebody calls the office to the time you're asking them to make a decision? And they basically had a two-step sales process. I said, well, in order to build a $300,000 relationship, excuse me, to get a $300,000 sale, you need to build a $300,000 relationship. And that can't happen in just two touches. So what is it for you? Perhaps what you sell might be, you know, $1,000, it might be $10,000, it might be, you know, a half a million dollars. But think about the quality and the level of relationship that you have to build. And that's where the, the, um, the strategy to deliver value and to, de to deliver based on trust and based on reputation can help reduce their price sensitivity. Because every step is only meant to sell the next step. When the receptionist gets the phone call, the first objective is not to try to sell them on anything other than does it make sense to have a consultation? From the consultation is, does it make sense to come in and meet our team? From the meet the team, does it make sense to proceed with their first round of design, right? So they're only making one small commitment at a time, which is why those follow-up systems are so important. Now, a little story about that is uh, a few years ago, I coached a stucco company, one of my two brothers, and I asked them, it's like, out of every 10 proposals that you do, how many of them become customers? And they didn't know the answer. So then we'll just go back over the last couple of months and, and add it up and find out. So they did, and they, they found out that on average over the past few months, uh, three out of every 10 proposals became paying customers. So they had a 30% conversion rate, which is okay. It's, you know, it's not bad, but it's not great either. So I said, well, what do you suppose happens to the other seven? Like, well, I don't know. I said, they probably found somebody cheaper 
to do the job. It's like, well, do you ever ask them? Do you ever follow up? Like, well, no, we figured if they want to do business with us, you know, we already gave them the price. They know everything they need to know. If they want to do business with us, they'll, they'll let us know. So, well, can you do me a favor? Can you just call and ask? Just follow up one time and see what, what's happening. And what they found was out of the seven, four of the seven had done nothing. They had not made any decision. They had not moved forward with, with any provider at all. And of those four, they closed two on the spot. And here's what the people said when they followed up. Hey, I've been meaning to contact you. Thanks for following up. In other words, you know that pile of good intentions you have, those things you've been wanting to do and meaning to do? Your prospects have that too, and you're in it. You're in their pile of good intentions. So just that one additional follow-up nearly doubled. They went from getting three out of 10 to getting five out of 10. What kind of an impact would that make on your business if you had some follow-up systems in place? Here's the next one, number of transactions. This is about repeat business. So earlier I asked, are there people who, um, customers who could be doing more, more business with you than they are, or are there customers who don't even know all the services that you could provide for them? Here's a few of the top strategies for increasing repeat business. Stay in touch systems. Right? Social media is great for this. Now, for some businesses, social media is great lead generation. For other businesses, social media is great uh, for retention and just kind of staying in touch with people and continuing to build relationships. Uh, could be loyalty offers that you might provide that somebody coming back as a repeat client might get a loyalty benefit that a new customer wouldn't get. But most important of all is the last one, which is just ask, right? So um, if you want more tips on this, because I'll go through this one pretty quickly, I did a video. It's on my YouTube channel. It's called How to Follow Up Without Being Lame. Um, so if you find your, that you're in the position where you feel like you don't know what to say and that you're just following up saying like, hey, how about now? You're ready now? You want to do any more business? And it feels kind of that old repetitive. You don't like making those connections and they probably don't like receiving those connections. That video will give you some ideas on how to um, follow up in a way that's more engaging and more relational um, and not so transactional or aggressive. Right? So you can go check that out at youtube.com slash Carrie Kaufman or you could just Google how to follow up without being lame and you'll find that video. The next one, average dollar sale. Again, this is about how much people spend at every transaction. Now, you might have numbers all over the board. Um, and I would expect that you do, but an average is still an average, right? So it's important that you know what is the average because you can't improve what you don't know. So you have to measure this. Now, if you offer two dramatically different types of service, like let's say, for example, my HVAC client, they can install a new system or they can do a maintenance uh, service call on an existing system. So we measure those separately because it's not super helpful to average, you know, the $7,000 new system with the $200 service call. So we evaluate those lines of business separately. But when you look at them individually, we, we can ask ourselves, how can we improve just this one and how can we improve just this one? So here's a few strategies for that. The first one, the obvious, increase your prices. Just curious, has anybody on the line raised your prices recently? Maybe this year, in the last couple of months? Awesome, glad to hear that, yeah. Um, checklist of services, right? This, you might notice some uh, repetition as we go on because the, the same uh, checklist of services was also a strategy for getting repeat business because it's about educating your uh, customers on everything that you do, right? So when you see it come up in multiple places, that means it's a, it's a double whammy, right? It's a double winning strategy. You can get more repeat business and you can, and, or you can increase your average dollar sale, which would also increase your margins, right? So when you see something come up multiple times, it's really a clue to pay attention to it. Um, add value versus discounting. Um, if you do have those, those points in time that you need to negotiate, let's say a customer is a little bit price sensitive, but they're still a good customer, but you just need to, you know, do that one extra little thing to get them to commit rather than discounting add value on instead. So, uh, for example, I coach a company that does air duct and dryer vent cleaning as well as chimney repair. Um, or even my, my carpet cleaning client does the same to do carpet cleaning and restoration. So instead of discounting, they'll say, well, you know, how about while we're on site, we'll go ahead and add in the protector at no additional cost. 
or my HVAC client might say, well, we'll go ahead and uh, clean, if we're gonna do an air duct clean, we'll throw in the dryer vent for you know, a, a nominal amount more or throw it in for free. Now what that does is it, first of all, protects the integrity of your brand because you're not giving a discount. But also think about it this way. Now that my carpet cleaning client for adding protector, that costs them about, I don't know, I'd say less than $15. Literally, literally with the technician's time to add the protector um, and the cost of the actual product itself is almost insignificant, but the perceived value to the customer, it might be a hundred bucks. So rather than giving the customer a discount of $20 or $30 or $50, they give them a hundred dollars worth of value at no cost. But my client still keeps the same amount of money. If they had discounted by 20 bucks, it actually cost them 20 bucks. If they add value, that might've cost them 10 or 15, right? Does that make sense? So look for ways that you can add value in those times that you do need to negotiate. And last, but certainly not least, fire those D clients. And you know who I'm talking about. These are the ones who nickel and dime you at every pass. They suck the life out of you. And at the end of the day, they're not even profitable. And if you look back in over history, you probably saw the red flags in the first place and maybe just ignored it or turned a blind eye and just hoped it would all be okay. But when you sniff those out, trust your gut, get rid of those D clients with the amount of time and effort and energy and money they cost you. If you didn't have that headache, you'd more than replace that revenue. You know, if you had that, that, that time and energy available to invest in growing the business in new ways, um, I guarantee you'd come, you'd, be better off for it profitably as well as in your sanity. So when it comes to pricing, are just, do people make buying decisions based on logic or emotion or what combination thereof? Any ideas? Yeah, you guys are right so far. Emotion. Our decisions are based on about 20% logic and 80% emotion. Because at the end of the day, people will pay more to do business with people that they know, like, and trust. Now let's move on and talk about margins. Here's a few key strategies for margins. Again, there's many, many more. I'll share that strategy picker with you in a little bit. But key ways to improve your margin is, first of all, just to know your numbers. Because you can't improve what you don't measure. Um, systems, technology, effective delegation, all of those help to boost your margins. Now, the interesting thing is you might say, well, Carrie, some of those strategies sound an awful lot like expenses, <laughs> right? Hiring more staff to delegate to, investing in technology, investing in systems. But if you, you know, if you, system stands for saving you stress, time, energy, and money. So some of these things, while on paper, an accountant might tell you that they would technically fall in the expense category, but from a coach's perspective, it's a margin booster. So let's take, for example, effective delegation. If you don't already have an admin, this is probably the first place you need to start. Because delegating to a kind of a, a lower wage earning employee, right? That's buying back your own time at a discount. So imagine you could get 10 or 20 hours of, of work, of your work a week off of your plate and onto somebody else's at a discount. And that freed you up. And let's say that out of the, the 15 hours a week that it freed you up, you spend five of those at home with your family and you reinvest 10 of them back into growing the business. Could you more than pay for whatever it costs you to hire that position? And that same logic could be applied to investing in technology or, or, or whatnot. Or it may be for some of you, you might be ready to make that next level of investment of investing in a general manager or somebody to hire a level that you tell yourself you can't afford, but you save a wage and you lose a fortune. There comes a point in time that you've got to make the investments because it really is an investment. It's an expense on the profit and loss statement, but if it enables your business and unlocks that next level of growth, it should more than pay for itself. So a case study I wanted to share about one of my clients with the power of knowing his numbers. This was a construction, a landscape construction company that had two sides of the business. They exclusively did commercial, um, well, with the exception of a couple of high-end personal estates uh, in the Rancho Santa Fe area. 
but the, the business was 70% landscape construction and 30% landscape maintenance. So naturally, the owner was investing most of his time in the 70% because that's where the money was. He was doing his best to grow that side of the business where he saw the most opportunity, but the company wasn't making profit. And they'd been in business for like 12 years, um, but over the span of a couple years, profit had really started to decline. So after evaluating some key metrics together, and taught, I taught him more about how his gross profit margins worked, and we talked about job costing, and I gave him some strategies to improve that. But what we realized through that process of really looking at his numbers was that the bigger side of the business was actually losing all the money, and the smaller side, while a significantly lower average dollar sale, was actually quite profitable. So in the interest of generating some quick cash, because that's what was needed, he went out and sold $90,000 of maintenance work in one quarter. Now, this was high margin work. In most cases, they were already on site. It didn't require any additional labor, only a tiny bit of additional time, no additional trucks, none of that was necessary. So it was $90,000 of probably 60% plus gross margin on that specific kind of work. Additionally, they saved $4,000 a month because we started looking at their job costing, at their labor ratios, we actually uncovered some theft in the process that had been going on at an increasing rate for quite some time, but never would have known if he didn't take the time to really dive into his numbers, right? So all this was by knowing what gauges we needed to look at, right? Because a lot of business owners, if you think about like gauges on your dashboard, we get into the, the, your, your business and you go full speed ahead, but all the gauges are all duct taped up. The only one you know is the fuel, right? You know how much cash you have, how much cash is in the bank, and that's it. But you wouldn't get in a helicopter with a pilot who only had a fuel gauge, right? You, all those other gauges exist for a reason. So what is it about your margins that you're not clear on? And if it's if it's a uh, job costing, like the, the NoFi software I know can help you with that. So if you're not fully utilizing those functions, um, you know, get with your rep and, and figure out how to make better use of the information you have because that'll empower you to make better business decision. Now, we just went through the five ways, but the systems and the team are the glue. They're the glue for making all of that work, right? So if you're the bottleneck in your business, because, you know, bottlenecks are always at the top of the bottle, right? So most of you here in the line, I believe, uh, said your owners to the company, so that likely means you are the bottleneck. And uh, I coach a company that does granite, tile, all sorts of various types of stone. And we've been working together for a few years. And a few months ago, he said, Carrie, things are going really good. We're actually exceeding our revenue goal, but it's becoming more and more evident that the business relies on me to connect all the moving parts, which was man manageable when his company was a quarter of the size, right? But the business has quadrupled over a couple of years and it's, no longer becoming manageable. So there's just a lot of steps from the time it takes to get a lead through all the way through to getting paid. And there's different people responsible for each step, but he kind of has to manually oversee the transitions between each step. So, so here's what we did. We analyzed where are the breakdowns? You know, how does your paperwork flow? Where is information getting lost? Where is uh, some information not getting into the right person's hand or relies on the owner to keep that global perspective to make sure all, all the wheels don't fall off. So where is the process getting stalled? Things like, well, the, um, the guys are on site and they ran out of materials. So they're calling the office and somebody's dropping what they're doing to go you know, take them some materials. You know, why is that happening? What about the paperwork? The, the, the paperwork, the drawing that got uh, left in somebody's truck and then it got shoved down the side of the seat. And nobody can find it. Right? It's just, it's silly, but I'm sure he's not the only person who's experienced breakdowns like that in his business. So, you know, now we're, what we're doing to remedy this is we're creating a flow using technology to make sure it helps to connect all the information without him manually controlling the switches, like relating this picture. So here's the, the our, our themed question. This is a question we're constantly asking him in coaching sessions, which is, What's the system solution here? Not just the immediate solution for the current situation. What's the system solution here? So somebody, something happens out in the field and something breaks down. Your gut reaction is to put on your cape and go fix it. Don't stop there. Why did this breakdown happen? What's the system solution, not just solving the immediate problem? Because I'll tell you what, earth is round. 
right? If you don't put that system in place, it's only a matter of time before Earth spins around and you've got that same problem again, right? It shows up a little bit differently, but the, you're not addressing the root cause, you're just addressing the symptoms. But you still gotta have the right players. The right players make all the difference. And a few of you mentioned that talent in the beginning. But when it comes to hiring, regardless of what level you're hiring, you might be hiring the most entry level, entry level labor position all the way through to a skilled position, but even at the most entry level, treat it like the $100,000 decision that it is because it's really what it's gonna cost you. The time and the effort to recruit, to interview, to do the paperwork, to do the onboarding, to train someone, and not to mention their salary and the taxes and the, you know, all the, the insurances and all those other things you gotta pay, and then possibly to have them not work out. Uh, perhaps there's an opportunity cost lost if, uh, if they make mistakes or if they're not as efficient as they could be, and then God forbid they don't work out and you have to start all over again. Every employee in your company is worth a minimum of six figures. Some of them might be worth significantly more than that. But imagine if your time wasn't taken up with the piddly tasks or the things that you don't enjoy. You know, imagine you had a team that you could confidently put in front of your best customer or prospect and know that they're going to say the right thing or behave in the same way congruent with your, your personal and your company core values. Imagine if you had an accountability system to make sure things got done right. Well, that can't happen when you're in control of it all. You as a leader, you're at the top, right? And there's these other things involved. There's the business itself, which is the operations and the finances and all that. You've got the team and you've got the customers. Now, what on this page are you responsible for? What's your primary responsibility of this? Some of you might say I'm responsible for all those things. I would propose that the cycle of business goes like this. If you as a leader make your primary focus the team, the team takes care of the customers, the customers fuel the business, and the business takes care of you. Now I wanna put in some numbers and show you how this formula for profit actually applies directly to your business. So there's the five variables in blue that we talked about. Now I'm gonna put in some fictitious numbers. If these, this is not a real client of mine, by the way, so if this doesn't look like your business, don't get too hung up on the specific example because I'll apply it to you in just a second. Let's say that you've got the, uh, this business and you get 1,000 leads over the course of a year and you close 25% of them, so you have 250 customers per year. On average, those customers do business with you once per year and when they do, they spend about $10,000. So your revenue is now 2.5 million. You've got pretty healthy margins of 10%, so your net profit at the end of the day is 250,000. Now, I've given you strategies to improve each of those five things. And this is a strategy picker I talked about. I know you can't read that version, um, but I'll put my email address up at the end. If you wanna email me, I will send you a PDF of this because there is literally more than you'll ever need to know about growing your business right on this one page. But let's say that you pick just a few of the things off this list or a few of the things that we talked about today. Is it reasonable if you approach marketing the way we talked about today that you could generate 10% more leads in your business than you have in the past year? Um, let's say this company does that. They go from 1,000 leads to 1,100, a 10% increase. Let's say they also get better at articulating their unique selling proposition. They get better at following up with people. They get better at building connection and relationship with people. And their conversion rate increases by 10%. So it goes from 25 to 27.5. Now they've gone from 250 customers to 302. Let's say they stay in touch with people. They offer add-on services, they, um, they connect on social media, they send out e-newsletters, right? They invite them to come back for more services and their average number of transactions goes from one to 1.1, right? A whopping 0.1% improvement. Same thing with their average dollar sale. Because they're better at articulating their value and because their marketing is reaching a higher quality target audience, they're able to raise their prices and, and, and value each transaction from 10,000 to 11,000, 10% improvement. The revenue has now gone from 2.5 million to 3.65 million. Same thing with their margins. When you improve the first four things, the margins will often naturally grow, go up as well. So their margins improve from 10% to 11%, and their profits now gone from 250,000 to 401,000. That's a 46% increase in revenue and a 61% increase in profit. 
with a 10% improvement in each of those five areas. Now, remember I said, don't get too hung up on the numbers. Take my fake numbers out and put your real numbers in. No matter what numbers you start with, if you improve those five things in blue by 10% each, your bottom line grows by 61%, always. It doesn't matter what you start with. That's why you have to know your numbers, because you can't improve what you don't know. So take a screenshot of this, it's actually being recorded. If you know what your numbers are, ask yourself, how can I, do I don't need to double my leads. I don't need to double my average dollar sale. I just need the power of compounding and a couple of key strategies for each of those. And that's the key to building a commercial profitable enterprise that can work without you. As Warren Buffett says, it's not necessary to do extraordinary things to get extraordinary results. And the com uh, company I told you about earlier, the third and fourth generation company, um, he said, I've been working with Coach Carey for about two years. Our business grew by 50% in 2017. We expanded our team the first quarter of this year, and we're on track for the company's best year in our three-generation history. Carey's been a great asset by helping us to grow as a company individually and also by improving our systems. This is from the HVAC client I told you about. I took over this business after my dad's sudden passing. I managed to grow up by continuing his legacy of great service, to, but to be honest, I had no idea how to run a business. With Carrie's help, I'm now on top of my finances, I have a great team in place, and I have the flexibility to attend every one of my daughter's sports games. So I'm curious, I'd love to hear from you, what blinding flashes of the obvious have you got today? And in other words, what can you take action on? An aha moment, one little idea, something that will take your business to the next level. I'd love it if you could share it with me. Awesome. Go ahead and keep typing those in. If you're still typing. I'm still reading. Firing D clients, adding value, the job of marketing, increased prices, lead follow up systems, the team. System solution, following up on bids, awesome. Good stuff today, guys. So, you know, you are where you are now, right? No, no matter where your business is or how long you've been around, um, I hope that today you got some good information. You know, if you're feeling like, you know, from you're feeling like this little hamster, you know, if I feel like I'm pedaling, 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 but I'm not actually going anywhere, I'm just going in circles. Or maybe you just had a few leaky pipes. You've got a lot of good things running really well in your business, but there's a few areas that you know profitability is leaking out. Or maybe you're on that cash flow roller coaster. I hope now that you know it doesn't have to be this complicated. Growing your business isn't a mystery. There actually is mathematical equation to it with some defined strategies to put in place to help you improve and tweak each of those numbers so that next year doesn't have to look like last year. Now you can stop repeating history and stop with the hopium, which is the number one drug addiction of business owners. You know, I hope this works. I hope this works. And instead, increase the flow, the flow of your business, the flow of the leads, the flow of the systems, the flow of communication. That all comes down to strategies. So I want to open it up to a um, couple of, uh, minutes of questions if we have any. Um, and also, if you got value out of this webinar, um, I would just ask you a favor. In fact, I'm going to put my contact information up there. So um, I would love it if you would take a minute and leave me a five-star review on whatever you prefer. If you're on Facebook or you're a Google user or LinkedIn or Yelp, um, subscribe to my YouTube channel. That would be the highest compliment you could pay me would be to leave me a five-star review online. Um, and if you want to copy that strategy picker, there's my email address. Carrie at CarrieKaufman.com. I'd be happy to share that with you. And I am now going to pass it over to Taryn. Sorry, Taryn, I went a couple minutes over. I'll pass it over to Taryn uh, to take it from here. Awesome. Thanks so much for the entire presentation. I think I, I learned a lot from that as well. Uh, really happy uh, you could do all this for us. Um, uh, you know, that's really, you know, I don't really have much else to add at that point. I think you gave, uh, you know, more information than I ever could. Um, if anyone has any questions, you know, that they want to submit in the text chat just before we log out here, we're happy to follow up on them. But 
Uh, I just want to thank you again, Carrie, for presenting today, for giving us uh, you know this, uh, all this information, uh, and uh, thank everyone else for attending today. You know, we will be record. You know, this was all recorded, so we will be posting it to our YouTube channel if anyone wants to watch at a later date to refer back to it. Um, but uh, other than that, uh, I appreciate everyone taking the time. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thanks again uh, for presenting, Carrie, and uh, everyone have a nice rest of your day. Take care.